Hello everyone, my name is Grigory Petrov, we are in the Euron office and in a few minutes we will take an interview with Yekihiro Matsumoto, author of the Ruby programming languages, just few months after the major Ruby 3.0 release with all the new shiny features that I want to ask Mats about. Okay, so three, two, one, and we are starting. So thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you for releasing Ruby 3.0. That's one big, amazing release with lots of experiments, lots of feedback, lots of challenges and lots of features. And uh, my first question that we are interested to discuss, which feature of Ruby 3.0 do you like the most? I like pattern matching, uh, including the right hand, uh, the right, right hand assignment. Is I, I like the, the syn that kind of the syntax enhancement uh, best, but at the same time, I very expect about uh, you know the raptor and the uh, raptor and the, the static type checking because it will change the culture, it will enhance the culture of Ruby programming. Yeah. Uh, starting type checking is... Uh, I'm sorry. Alexa, stop. Oh, technology. Yeah, sometimes we are trying to talk with us. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, uh, static type checking is really amazing. And as a software developer and big fan of type checking, I am looking forward to see how your idea will play out, where types are added into standard library and frameworks. So developers can not include types, but have all checks in place. Uh, and uh, pattern matching, yeah, I really like it. I miss it in Python and it's a pleasure to uh, use it in um, Ruby. Uh, all these uh, features, uh, Ruby 3.0 is backward compatible. And uh, that's actually great because we developers uh, hate to break things. But uh, still we uh, want new shiny things like pattern matching or right hand uh, assignment. And um, this uh, idea of not breaking backward um, compatibility. Uh, how happy are you with uh, results? Uh, is it playing out? Is it good? Uh, can you recommend this approach for other languages? I don't know, Python 4 maybe, or JavaScript uh, version uh, next. Is it a good idea to keep backward compatibility? Yes. Uh, the when you know, when we when I start the Ruby programming, so the the Ruby community was pretty small, and then very few people use Ruby. And even when they use Ruby, they, these programs are very trivial. So the, it's okay to throw out the older version. So that we are okay to change, break the, the syntax of the Ruby language at the time. But as time went by. And the uh, Ruby community grows big. We are tons of maybe millions or tens of millions of Ruby programs all over the world. So that uh, even the tiniest change can break the things. So that uh, last time I we made a big uh, big breakage uh, in Ruby one nine. We had learned uh, learned the lesson. So that uh, the big breakage could split the community for a long, long uh, time. That 
that is kind of tragedy because uh, you know we are working on the newer version, but the, some part of the community uh, left out in the the old unchanged version of Ruby. So the uh, our improvement, performance improvement, syntax enhancement on the or the, any other new features would not uh, reach to the, the separated uh, community. That is kind of big tragedy. So that I made some kind of the decision after Ruby 1.9 one, one so that we, I, we are not going to make a big breakage even on the, the major version uh, release, right, like 3.0. Uh, that's why I try to keep the, the backward compatibility for Ruby 3. Uh, also, the, the other language had a similar issue, which taught us, uh, you know, the importance of the, the backward compatibility like a Python 3 issues or, or a PHP 6 issue, or the Java, Java, even JavaScript have similar issues. So that, you know, language designers want to make progress, want to make changes, want to make, uh, improve their language. The, but the, most of the cases at the cost of the compatibility. And uh, we've learned that is not good. So that uh, I try to keep the compatibility as much as we can. As you said, so that developers like new things. So that we must, we must add new things to the newer version. So that it's kind of the contradiction. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but uh, I think we tried our best and uh, yeah, for, at least for Ruby 3.0, so that we've done pretty well, we believe. <laughs> yes, that's uh, really well done. And I hope that other languages can uh, follow on your steps and also keep backward compatibility. Actually, I remember 10, 15 years ago, all these tragedies with uh, Python transition from version two to version three. For some years, core developers wasn't even sure, should, we con uh, should they continue developing Python three or just fall back to version two? And uh, PHP, uh, sad story. Uh, I'm happy that uh, right now we are at the stage of uh, development where we can bring amazing feature without making millions of developers uh, sad. And uh, about features, uh, programming languages do borrow uh, features from uh, each other, um, lots of um, uh, features. Uh, I can see pattern matching in uh, Ruby, it's uh, amazing, uh, hash destructuring. Uh, so my fellow developers, they can use same hash destructuring in Python, in JavaScript, now in Ruby. Uh, this uh, unique right-hand assignment, it really helps. And maybe in few years uh, it uh, will be borrowed in Python or um, JavaScript. So, what are your plans for next versions? Do you have some crazy ideas, uh, some things that you want to borrow or just test drive? Uh, that's pretty good questions. Uh, but uh, we have been focusing on Ruby 3.0 for a long, long time. And uh, it's only a month since the release. <laughs> so that, yeah, I have not yet have the, the those crazy ideas for the future yet, but uh, well, I'm thinking about some ideas. But uh, it's enhancing the rockers and mm. uh, kind of the module system uh, for the Ruby. You know, mm. uh, Java, Java, and uh, you know Python had the mo module system like import something like that, and uh, mm. the Ruby 
does not have those kind of the module system, just just requires the loading the features from mm -hmm. uh, from the, the files. And uh, we might be, it, it might be useful to uh, provide some kind of structured uh, modules. We have modules in Ruby, so the packaging systems, mm -hmm. maybe. And uh, what else? Yeah, we have. I have some vague ideas, but not yet that concrete to to disclose mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, maybe you have to wait a year or so. <laughs> no uh, problems. I am writing code for twenty years, and I will be happy to write code for twenty more years. Uh, by the way, Ruby um, packaging system uh, may be not. Uh, so full featured as in Java, for example, but Ruby uh, allows to uh, install and use multiple versions of uh, same uh, dependency. And that's actually great uh, because uh, Python, for example, can use only one version of uh, dependency that brings um, lots of uh, issues. And with um, JavaScript, uh, Node.js, uh, they just uh, put uh, versions in the specific uh, directory. So Ruby feels uh, pretty much great with uh, current system, but improvements, improvements are always welcome. Maybe we can prepare some kind of the container, the, 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 the gem containers, so, the, so that the, the different version of gem can be residing in the different con container or something like that. Yeah, that's one idea. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe true. Yeah, we have lots of time to uh, test them out. Um, by the way, um, why you experiment with all these features and look uh, on the other languages and their uh, evolution. There are lots and lots of programming uh, languages with new ones uh, always uh, appear. Uh, so uh, how do you keep an eye on them? Uh, do you have some RSS uh, subscriptions or developers come to you and like, see this new feature, you need to check them, or some news uh, websites. Uh, how do you keep an eye on all these new languages and features they offer? Uh, the, my input channel is the base, the, the, my major, uh, the input channel is the, my, uh, the, my Ruby Redmine. So mm -hmm. the bugs.rubylang.org uh, Redmine. So that we have tons of proposals from the community and uh, those those proposals inspire me to to, to design new features. So the, some the, I had to reject most of them, but uh, these ideas to improve the language can inspire me to design new one new ideas. That's the one things. Uh, before the you know before the pandemic, so that I attend the many conferences and I talk with the people. And about the Ruby and uh, about uh, the language in general, prog uh, programming in general, so that uh, I can see the you know the obstacles and the irritations or the you know some kind of the you know, drawbacks of the language and the, the, the environments or something, and then try to improve that. That kind of the you know talks, uh, the conversations uh, would inspired me uh, as well. And uh, it, that's one big drawback of the pandemic. So that, you know, I cannot have that kind of conversation no longer for last year, year and a half or something. That's silly, uh, that's sad. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, the I, you know, the web surfing on the internet and the, I see some the blog, uh, blog entries about the, the programming language and the Ruby and then those those articles would uh, inspire me as well.
Mm -hmm. So uh, if uh, anyone of our uh, listeners or anyone who see us um, this recording um, right now, if you want to offer some interesting idea to Yukihiro Matsumoto, please, please use Ruby Redmine to suggest. And uh, about this uh, pandemic issue, uh, everything is from home, all conferences are uh, online. How it uh, affected uh, Ruby development, adoption, community from your point of view? Well, the day-to-day -day development has not changed that much because you know, I'm living far from Tokyo and then most other core developers are living in Tokyo. So that uh, our developers meeting or the developers communications are heavily based on internet uh, from before the yeah, even before the pandemic. So that uh, those process uh, did not change. But uh, uh, as I said before, we don't have the you know physical conferences, so that our communication channel is a little bit tighter. So that, that, that is one, uh, one bad thing. But uh, at the, in, on the contrary, so that I don't have to travel that much so that I can stay home, so that I have more time on my, on, in front of my PC so that I can spend, I can spend more time to program or the Ruby itself. That is actually uh, great. Uh, by the way, uh, during the last uh, pandemic uh, year, I created and attended lots of online uh, conferences and so are uh, you. Uh, what is your opinion about these new online conferences? Are they helpful? Um, do they provide the same level of communications for us uh, developers? Can you collect uh, feedback on them and uh, communicate with other uh, Ruby developers? What is your opinion? You know, for the, for the conference attendees, we, we, we can see a lot of the you know, presentations through the conferences and then full of the information. But that, that value is still available from the online conferences. That's okay. That's good things. But at the same time, the, the, you know, offline communication, like uh, having dinner together or the, having a you know, silly conversation together, that kind of the side channel is dropped from the online conferences. That, that is kind of something we, I missed very much. For me, so the, the, the value of the conference is that, that, that kind of communications. So that, yeah, I miss that kind of things to, uh, very much. But uh, for, the, you know, for the usual attendee, so that they learn a lot from the, the presentations. So that, the, that, that kind of the conference value is still available. Yeah, uh, in Russia, all conferences are online uh, right now. We hope to do some small offline events uh, in, in the fall of uh, 21, but uh, we think that we will create uh, online Ruby Russia 21, so do not take uh, any risk. Uh, by the way, uh, are you interested to joining us uh, at our online Ruby Russia conference from the comfort of your home? Uh, thank you. I will send you an uh, invite in a few months and hope we will uh, think some ways to provide these additional uh, channels because as a uh, Russian developers community and conference uh, organizers, they think that the main flavor of um, IT conference is uh, it's a place for software developers to communicate with each other. And uh, talk itself, uh, it is 
not uh, a talk in university. It's not an action to teach people someone. It's um, something different. Uh, speakers, they raise awareness about some topic, but uh, our idea is to communicate with uh, developers about uh, this topic, about uh, Ruby, about new features, about new applications, and so on. Uh, I hope that uh, our community will be able to mimic uh, all these uh, in the online experiments. And uh, by the way, about uh, features, uh, you do lots of experiments with Ruby language, you add features to better version and uh, you remove features if uh, you and developers dislike them. Uh, I have not seen such a uh, thing in uh, other languages. Uh, how unique uh, is it uh, for Ruby? Did you saw something like that for other languages or you are the only person who does it? And uh, what are pros and contrast for such approach where you give hundreds of thousand developers to try something, but if it do not play out, you take it back. Okay, when the Ruby community is small and they don't care about the change, so that we don't have to do experiment. So that every, everything is experimental. So that we can do that and then if you want, I, if it, it didn't work out, so that it just removed it, so that nobody cares about the compatibility. But the good old times uh, went away, so that we have the very huge community, so that so the the change, the the cost of the change is uh, getting bigger and bigger each year. The at the same that means that so the Ruby. Yeah, that any design decision cannot be retrieved. So that that means the designer, that me, uh, cannot make mistake. That's, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm only a human. <laughs> and and uh, I admit I make, I make very many mistakes. So that, you know, that's kind of the, you know, awful things. The, the, at the same time, the Ruby community is big, big enough. But, uh, we have a huge community, but the, uh, the, our developer community, the Ruby core developer teams, is not big enough to predict the future. So now, you know, if I can propose something, and then uh, if we can experiment the, these ideas within the core community. Uh, that's okay, but uh, uh, our core community is not big enough to experiment those ideas uh, uh, before the release. So that it's kind of the you know compromise. Mm -hmm. Experiment is a compromise fit for the the current size of the community. So that uh, the big community to that does not allow me to make mistake, but a small uh, core community that cannot experiment, experiment new ideas within the, with the core community. Mm -hmm. so I have to market experimental so that, okay, some, we, this idea may be removed in the future. And then the ask community to try out. So that, once a core community is big enough to experiment everything, we don't have to uh, do that kind of the experimental process to the, the main users community. But uh, right now, it is a com compromise to mm -hmm. fit the current size of the, the Ruby community. Uh, got it. Now I completely uh, understand why such yeah, decision. Probably the, the other language, like a Python community, is big enough to experiment everything in the, the core developers, maybe, or the PHP. But the current Ruby community size is not does not allow that kind of process. So that it 
that's our compromise. Mm -hmm. um, from the figures I see, uh, Ruby community is growing, language adoption is growing, so I hope that uh, in a few years uh, you will have a solid uh, choice to put experiments within core developers and all Ruby developers all over the world will have a final version that uh, they can um, use. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, but in addition, but, uh, uh, the language design is pretty, uh, in, you know, pretty fun. You know, language design itself is pretty fun. So that, uh, that kind of the one very big benefit of the exp this kind of the language experiment experiment uh the you know inviting users community the broader ruby community to the the design of the language so that you know the users can express their ideas opinions about the new experiment of the uh, of the language design you know if once we uh, you know, the close those kind of process into the core community, the users cannot involve in the language design. So that uh, th this is one benefit. So that I don't know, maybe uh, once even when we our the core community is big enough, maybe I disclose some kind of experiments to the uh, broader user community to in you know, to allow them to involve in the language design. Mm, yeah, or users who want to be involved in the language developer, they can join core community and so prove that uh, they are, I don't know, worthy to uh, take place in all these uh, experiments. Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, but... You know, the most Ruby users did not think about the idea of joining to the design process. So that, you know, we have, yeah, that kind of the invitation is uh, pretty much useful for the you know, user's community, I think. So I have a um, tricky uh, question about all new reactors and uh, I think your fibers. I uh, myself is a great fan uh, of um, uh, concurrency, both par parallelism and uh, multitasking. And right now in Ruby 3, uh, developers have um, a big choice. For parallelism, we can use processes or we can use new rectors. And same for multitasking. We can use old good threads or we can use all new shiny asyncio fibers. Um, but for <clears throat> um, ordinary common, uh, how to uh, name uh, them, for typical Ruby developer, uh, they are middle Ruby developer with five to six years of experience. Uh, how can they make an educated choice? How can they select between processes and actors for one tasks or between threads and uh, asyncio fibers for other tasks? Uh, maybe you can share some piece of advice for them. For web applications, so the web developers, so they, you, they don't have to care about the uh, concurrency because of the, you know, the application servers like Unicorn, the Puma, and uh, the Falcon. So the, those uh, application servers take care of concurrency. So the, the Unicorn use processes, Puma use threads, the, the Falcon use fibers. So that uh, the, that kind of the, the choice of the application server uh, is direct. Uh, it, it connect to the, the choice of the concurrency system. The, uh, maybe we are going 
going to have the, some kind of the raptor based web ap application server in the future, but uh, not mm -hmm. yet. But uh, those kind of the choice of the application server is di directly uh, leads to the choice of the, uh, the concurrency model. So that you don't have, uh, the web developers do not have to care about the concurrency. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the, for the, develop, the, the typical developers, uh, the experiment about the concurrency, so the, it's about the, uh, the you know, where, where bottlenecks lives. For example, the, if the bottlenecks is living in the I.O. IO processes, so that you have, you'd better, uh, it's wise to choose the, the aging fiber. The aging fiber is optimized to the IO mul uh, multiplexing. So that uh, it, if your program uh, uses a lot of I IO communications, so that, that choose aging fiber. And uh, if you want to experiment with the, the multi-core, the CPU-heavy task, so the choose reactors. The, that's a, the basic choice. Uh, because the ra current, current implementation of the reactor so the matches the one reactor to one native threads, so that you cannot create the millions of reactors because of the one reactor uh, consumes the one meg to four meg of the stack space. That means the, the thousand reactors uh, consumes the four gigs of memory or something like that. So that, that, that is too huge for the, you know, the create the, the, the many, many reactors. Mm -hmm. But uh, for fibers, fibers only consumes a few kilobytes of memory. Or, or less, so that you don't have to worry about the, the cost, memory cost of the, the, the fibers, so that you, you can create as much uh, fibers you want. The, the, that's the, the second uh, the criteria of the choice. But uh, the Koichi, who in charge of the, the implementation of the reactors, is trying to improve the uh, improve the reactor so that the uh, reactor would maybe in the future the reactor would not consume that much of memory and then maybe the uh, we don't create that as much of the native threads so that uh, once those kind of improvement of achieved uh, we don't have to care about the, the number of the, the reactor allocated or maybe we can use the reactor as in the routine in Go. Mm -hmm. But it is the future story. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, that future sounds bright. Uh, as for now, I really like the uh, idea for uh, framework uh, offers uh, to put um, some like famous Ruby convention over configuration so Ruby developers uh, can use the model that uh, was pre-selected by framework offers. And uh, after that, uh, in case if something is slow, Ruby developers can dig deeper and maybe switch uh, rails to a uh, different uh, concurrency primitive. That's uh, great to have some choice. Um, one more question about uh, not concurrency itself, uh, but speed. Uh, recently, I stumbled uh, upon uh, a short article of uh, David Hanneman Hansen, who mentioned an interesting observation that um, for his entire fleet of servers that uh, provides Basecamp and Hey.com email uh, service, only 15% is for Ruby language itself. Everything else is uh, databases, message queues, caches, and so on. And David, uh, he said that, uh, for example, if Ruby became 10 times faster, 
but it's 10 times faster, only 15% of uh, server fleet. Uh, it will not bring uh, much uh, to the table. And uh, I thought that um, really for such a language like uh, Ruby, that is high level language, a command language for low level C code, how important is raw speed? And uh, I want to forward this uh, question to you as a language author. Uh, what do you think about raw speed of a language? How important is for a Ruby language? I have kind of mixed feeling. And uh, as, as in, in the DHH interview or any other things, the, in reality, the uh, the for most of the web applications, the uh, Ruby, especially the business logic of the web application, is not the bottleneck. The, the most of the time spent in the database, the network connections, the, you know, those kind of things, operating systems. So the, the we spent, no, I don't say most, but the mat, much time, uh, much time of the application uh, time is spent in the database, network, and the, op uh, the operation, operating system kernels. So that, uh, if, you know, if the, the performance of the, the language or the virtual machine matters that much, so that, you know, the GitHub do not use the Ruby or Shopify do not use Ruby, then many, many uh, big applications, big web services do not use Ruby. But in reality, those big services uh, use Ruby for a long, long time, and they grow so big and without, uh, without any problem. So, that, uh, so if the developers has realistic view so that people focus on the productivity of the programmer, so that we focus on that kind of productivity, so that performance is not the, the you know the biggest issue. The, but at the same time, I have been uh, you know it's my opinion for a long, long time since a few years ago, until four few years ago. But uh, I realized so many people make decisions based on the micro benchmarks. You know, some kind of the, you know, calculating Fibonacci numbers <laughs> or the, maybe the, you know, the factorial or something like that. <laughs> or maybe the, some kind of the, you know, DNA sequencing or maybe ray tracing. Or famous n-body problem with yeah. uh, three, uh, with four planets and uh, gravitation between them. And the body uh, problem, yes. Uh, that, that's kind of silly, but it's at the same time, it's kind of the developer instinct. So that uh, a few years ago, maybe two years ago, I, I just gave up. <laughs> I just gave up to, to act against the instinct. So that I try to improve the Ruby performance even on the micro benchmarks. So that that's that's one of the my past three or goal, you know, improving uh, Ruby performance even on the micro benchmarks. And the JIT, JIT compiler is one of them. You know, the JIT compiler does not at at the moment if uh, uh, JIT compiler does not improve the performance of the Rails application that much because of the, you know, the bottleneck of the Rails application is set in the database access or network access. But, uh, you know, the JIT compiler can improve the uh, performance of the micro benchmarks. That's okay. Okay. So that we are uh, improving uh, the Ruby performance in every aspect, including the micro benchmarks. So that uh, one, I, since some years ago, so that I'm uh, focusing on the micro benchmark, performance of the micro benchmarks too. It's, it's kind of silly, but uh, it's, 
it's for the the instincts of the developers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, JIT uh, actually helps. Uh, last time I checked this uh, artificial micro benchmark uh, and body problem. Uh, just enabling JIT for uh, Ruby makes it uh, 10 times faster. So that really helps. But, uh, yeah, we are not we are not fighting with the interest, against the instinct. <laughs> Uh, we have just a few uh, questions uh, left and the last uh, technical uh, question about uh, batteries included in the standard library. There are like uh, two uh, approaches. Uh, first one, uh, Python is famous for it. Very huge standard library with everything like FTP client, email client, zip archive, you name it, it's in the standard library. Uh, new developers, beginner developers like it because uh, they can um, use tutorials, uh, they can get everything uh, without installing uh, dependencies, everything just works. Uh, core developers like it much less because uh, they need to support this huge standard library. They can't make breaking changes because it upset all the developers who learn language. And um, um, these libraries, they are getting old pretty fast. Uh, another approach is Ruby, a uh, basic uh, low-level standard library and an ecosystem that flourish and uh, offers competitive solutions for everything. Uh, that's uh, great for developers, competition, drive innovation, so on, but new developers, they are uh, astonished, uh, like uh, which one to use, do we need to use uh, uh, this library or that library or that gem or this one, so it's kind of uh, controversy. What do you think about uh, this uh, controversy? Yeah. Uh, the, the Python the body included approach is uh, pretty attractive when when we are making Ruby 1.8. So the uh, Ruby 1.8 took similar approach, like a, we call it the sumo approach, the big fat uh, release. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the, as time goes by, so that some uh, some libraries left un unmaintained. So the maintenance went uh, went away or maybe retired or the maybe uh, graduated and, and then get a job too busy to work on Ruby or something like that. So the, uh, our small sumo approach was not, uh, went very good. So that we changed our approach to the separated, uh, the gems. So that, by the time of the Ruby 2.0, the Ruby Gems community is has, is set up to the for the, the general availability. And then, you know, remember the Ruby 1.8 did not have the Ruby Gems. Yeah, uh, at least we did ha have the Ruby Gems, but not very few people used them. The, the, by the Ruby 2.0, the Ruby Gems community is getting bigger and bigger, and everyone uses the Ruby Gems anyway to, to uh, develop, the, say for example, the Rails application. So that, uh, if everyone uses Gems, so that we don't have to uh, bundle everything to the standard distribution, so that we gradually separated the standard library or the bundle library into Gems, and then the, took away from the standard distribution to make the, our standard distribution slim and uh, maintainable but, uh, and uh, less garbage. And, uh, remember though, our community is not big enough to be an uh, expert of everything. For example, the, uh, the, in general, our core developers do are uh, not web developers. So that, we are not good at maintaining the web-based technology like a web break or maybe the HTTP clients or, maybe the, or the, even the, the XML, XML processing. So that, uh, the, it's 
good idea. It was good idea for us to to leave up. You know, keep those uh, unmaintained gems away from the away from uh, the standard distribution to to the mid and uh, making them gems. The, if one want uh, those gems, just install them. And uh, if they want to make the better, the more uh, nicely maintained gems, the, you can create uh, the competitive gems or something like that. But that's a, you know, the, the natural competition is good things. But the, I took those approaches. So the current approach, the, the standard distribution uh, slim, and uh, the making gem nourished is the, uh, the kind of the optimization to the Ruby community uh, nature and the size and the expertise of the core developers. Mm -hmm. Ah, got it. Uh, with uh, this uh, pandemic uh, issue and everything online, learning and education also went online. And uh, through the last two years, I see lots and lots of uh, courses, blogs, uh, and uh, places where developers can learn uh, Ruby. Uh, they have new services, I especially like uh, Real Python for Python language, and I hope uh, something this great will be uh, created for um, Ruby, and there are lots of new services. So, uh, what would you recommend for new developers who learn Ruby or for seasoned uh, developers who just brush up their knowledge for Ruby free, uh, which books or maybe blogs or maybe learning platforms would you recommend for them in year 2021? Even in the year 2021, the, the Rails tutorials and the Rails guide is the best uh, this learning material to the to the the program for the, the you know the beginner programmers uh, because you know web application is a good good example of programming because of the it's very close to have the the, the real product you know you know the in the past like uh, for example the, the the basic programming in 40 years ago so that we have the civil lines of basic programming and then that we have the some uh city you know city games or something like that and uh, that's a, a good introduction to the program for us you know the old timers the, the nowadays and uh, the web application is for them so that the like you know, the running the scaffolding and uh, filling out the several lines of the Ruby code makes the, the very simple web applications. And you can enhance those web applications in in, in uh, seconds. And then you see the updated, uh, improved your, your web applications. So that, that kind of the short cycle of development will encourage uh, developers to learn more things. So that, uh, that means the the rail tutorial and the rails guide uh, is the very good the the learning experience experience I mean so that after that you can learn you know say for example the inside of the rails or the inside of the ruby or maybe you can learn you know whatever you want the machine learning or the embedding system the system programming whatever but uh, for beginners the web application itself is the good starting point i think uh yeah we also try to uh, teach with uh, web uh, development because uh, it's what people consume every day so they are creating familiar things mm -hmm. And uh, my last uh, question. Uh, recently, I saw uh, lots of uh, Ruby awards in uh, Japan, all these photos where government officials like prefecture heads, they uh, thank developers for um, uh, their work and uh, so on. Uh, I did not see 
anything like that in other countries or for other languages. So uh, is uh, this uh, appreciation from government and all the government run events uh, for Ruby something specific to Japan, Japanese culture, or maybe it's something specific for Ruby or both of them? Well, uh, the, you know, the developer community is quite similar even in Japan and uh, outside of Japan, if, for example, the Russia, the United States, and Europe, uh, everywhere. But uh, the difference is that, you know, the Ruby is considered to be born in Japan, so that uh, some people in Japan want to encourage them, especially the, you know, the local government sectors. Uh, the, but uh, they are not developers. So the, the, but uh, at the same time, I, I personally have a good relationship with the, say, governors and the mayors of the, the, some cities. So that, uh, they want to encourage Ruby and the Ruby uh, community so in, in, the, in the sense of the, you know, the organizing the conferences in Japan and uh, giving uh, some kind of the awards and the prize to, to the community. So that, that's the, their way to to encourage community uh, the, of the technology, which considered to be born in Japan. So that, that in that sense, the, those kind of the, the local government programs is uh, quite unique to Japan. But uh, the, except that the developers community is uh, quite similar to, to other country, even Japan. Oh. That's uh, amazing. I uh, hope to visit uh, Japan uh, yeah. someday after everything uh, uh, ends. And um, see you uh, later at fall 2021 on Ruby Russia. Uh, thank you a lot, really a lot. Uh, I hope that uh, my questions, your answers, our discussion will help uh, developers to become better, to write uh, better code, uh, to be happy uh, writing uh, better uh, code. So, arigato gozaimasu, Yuki hiro -san. Thank you. See you, Bob. See you. Bye-bye.